Hey guys, I'm back from my holidays and I'm starting off with a really great custom shelf for a client. I'm going to show you how to make deep holes and thin shelves to hide screws, how to make interlocking shelves straight or at an unusual angle, and how to make perfect miter joints without the use of a miter saw, which would actually make them less than perfect if not tuned perfectly, which is impossible. And at the end, I will also make a giveaway for one of my custom made pens, so stay tuned throughout the video. Now my clients chose to use glue laminated beach framework to have the same appearance as their stairs, which meant I didn't have to do any glue ups or initial cuts for the dimensions. I rather ordered them at the right size and then worked the adjustments. The first task I had to do was prepare the boards individually and add grooves at every intersection they had with other boards. The first step was to create the tools for the job, so I started making some MDF supports for my router to make sure I was able to cut grooves the right size inside the boards. Now this can be done manually, but since I have the right tools for every job, I figured I'd make some over thickened planks and then cut them down to the right dimensions with the CNC router. Alternatively, you could always glue strips to the top of the MDF board with the right space between each. Unfortunately, it wasn't as easy for the second tool. You see, I also had 7.5 degree intersections to prepare for, which meant making grooves at an angle. Again, you could cut many right triangles with 7.5 degree angles with a bandsaw and glue them up to make this board, but instead I used the CNC to just cut out a 7.5 degree slope. I then sanded it down to make sure the face was flat. If it wasn't, I wouldn't have enough friction against the part it's placed on and it might move around despite the clamps, resulting in failed grooves or damaging the part with the router. I marked the cuts I needed to make on the boards and also marked the 7.5 degree angles on the side of the boards. That allowed me to verify that my router jig was at the correct angle to make grooves. I then added an MDF strip to the ends of those jigs to have a depth stop for the router. Unfortunately, it seemed at this point that I'd made a mistake in the dimensions of the router base because I started doing a test cut and it turns out it was cutting too wide. This is why it's best to measure twice. Luckily, the groove I made didn't matter because I was guiding with the jig and not with the groove I made in the jig, so I just added a piece of wood with the right width onto the jig to reduce the groove width. The result was exactly what I wanted, with planks fitting perfectly inside the groove with a little bit of tolerance for the finish. Just to make it better, I still remade the jig and it looked great, so the 7.5 degree jig was also made the same way. Once that was done, I started removing as much material as I could before routing the grooves to remove most of the mechanical constraints on the router bit. I started with a jigsaw that I cut the boards with either straight or at that 7.5 degree angle. Uh, French people are going to judge me here because Eco Plus is like the worst brand you could possibly imagine for tools. They're not even specialized in tools, they mostly make food. Uh, but in the end, I even had so much blade drift with that tool that I had to find a new method to pre-cut the boards. I also tried to pre-cut with a saw, but since I had about 30 grooves to make, that would have taken forever, so I ended up preparing the cuts on the miter saw. Then I simply removed the excess with a chisel. Once cut, I trimmed the grooves to the right size by aligning the jig with my marks and cutting using the router with straight bits. I also added tape to the extremities to avoid tear out, but unfortunately, since these are glue laminated frameworks I was working on, I encountered situations where I had very low thickness glue ups which still got torn out by the router. To fix this, I cut some beach with matching grain with a chisel from another board and glued it onto the part with torn wood and then trimmed it down. Apologies for the blurriness, by the way. Now there were two more things to do with the router. The first thing was to make a blind groove in one of the boards for fitting another board in there, which I also made with the jig. And the final thing was to add a blind female dovetail in one of the boards as well as a half depth male dovetail in another one of the boards for extra hidden support. The first method for the male groove didn't seem that safe, so I put the board down on the table and took care of the other side. Then I cut down half the length with a saw and used the world famous flick maneuver to get rid of it. The final step was to add grooves in a smaller shelf for it to slide on dowels later on. Moving on to the perfect miter joints. I did something very similar to the router grooves by trimming the largest part of the board edges at a 45 degree angle, but left about 1 or 2 millimeters of material for the final trimming. This is where it gets interesting because I can never get proper perfect miter joints with a miter saw, especially for lengths like those. So I actually found a gigantic 45 degree router bit for 27 millimeter boards, basically 1 inch boards, which as you can see is much bigger than standard router bits. To avoid having a cantilever, I also rested the board on a box that I had that was just the right size. 
I then added tape to the top of the chamfer and used that tape to super glue another straight piece of wood on top of it. This is a guide for the router bearing. Now I also added a piece after the board and clamped it against the board to avoid tear out. The end result is an absolutely perfect miter joint which is much more precise than any other method I know. The next step was the drilling step. Some holes were meant for dowels for shelves, some for screws that I would later hide with a nice method I'll show you later in this video, and some holes were to screw the shelves into the wall directly. Now those are the really deep holes that I was talking about at the beginning of the video. To make those, I measured the width of the drill and calculated the height of the wedges I needed to put under the board for the center of the drill to be at the same heights on the table as the holes in the board. As I'm doing those calculations, I just want to say that if you want to participate in the giveaway for the pen, subscribe with notifications and comment the words, woodworking is awesome, followed by any question or comment you may have regarding this build or my channel or anything you may want to talk about. Here's hoping you get a chance to win. Now it turns out 20.25 millimeters is the exact thickness of decking boards here in France. So I just cut one up and raised the board for drilling. I also used masking tape to mark the drill to know how deep I should go with the holes. And after making the hole centers, I drilled with a 12 millimeter bit to pass the screw heads and then moved on to a six millimeter hole for the screws themselves. As you can see, this method isn't perfect, but it's far more than sufficient because you only get a one to two millimeter deviation from your target, which is sufficiently precise. And I'll show you why during the final assembly of the shelves. The next step was the glue up of the miter joints. I put masking tape on the miter cut corners to make sure not to make a mess and to make it easier for me, I actually assembled the whole shelf on the floor to glue the parts together. That's when I realized the actual scale of the shelf, which is damn huge. I spread the glue between the corners using a brush and squeezed the glue using tape and the residual pressure from the corners being forced together by the structure of the shelf. On some, I also added screws, but the client specifically asked for no visible screws, so I used pluck cutters to make matching dowels that I glued inside the holes and later trimmed down. I also added a few dowels for another shelf that would go inside at the very end. I came back to my miter joints and cleaned the excess glue up using a chisel. I also cut up some sapelli strips to make splines for the mitered edges. Surprisingly enough, I thought of a simpler way to assemble splines than using a saw. I actually made the cuts using my biscuit jointer perpendicular to the miter joint, and that gave me an effective method to make grooves for the splines. I glued those in to rigidify the miter edges by adding a sheer resistance to them. I went manual for the trimming and chose to do that with a hand plane. The finish was a 240p sanding across every face, edge, and corner of the shelf. Once everything was complete, I started adding a proper polyurethane finish that was the same one used for their stairs and gives a nice yellowish tone to the wood. Now I had an intern at this point helping me out, which was welcome because putting two coats of this is a long task. At the end, we did a 1500 grit manual sanding to get a pleasant soft feel to the wood. Now it was finally time to deliver the shelf, so I went to my client's home and they allowed me to film the assembly, which was pretty cool of them, and I added black plastic film, as you can see, to protect the shelves during transport. Using a very long screwdriver extension with a magnetic bit holding a punch, we marked the whole positions to drill in the wall, and this is why it wasn't important to be precise to the millimeter. Now after adding hollow wall anchors, we screwed the shelf on using the screwdriver extension, holding a Phillips size 3 bit for massive M6 by 80 metal screws, and the final assembly could then take place, starting with the large horizontal element. The fact that they asked for it to be hollow in the middle made it much more complicated than if it was a full piece, but it fit perfectly regardless. The second element was the one I was worried about because of the 7.5 degree angles and polyurethane varnish thickness, but it turns out to fit perfectly as well, and this is why it was important to add tolerances to the intersections. Same for the small final plank, but that one was an easy fit. The screws were also well hidden, which was more than satisfying for my clients. Now this was what it looked like when going up the stairs, and honestly it was wonderful to see it match perfectly with the environment. The intersections were discreet without any additional parts than the wood, the miter joints look great, and not a single screw or fixture can be seen from the outside. They allowed me to film it with their books and decorations in it, and I kid you not, they started with a bunch of comics by a guy called Greg. I could not invent this if I wanted to. Now what you see when coming inside the house is a space in the ceiling with a perfect view onto the shelf, which really looks like a beautiful statement piece.
The final result is absolutely fantastic and I have got to say they have a hell of a taste in terms of interior design because the sketch they sent me and consequently the final shelf mixes flawlessly with the rest of the surroundings and the decorations inside it are beautiful. I hope you liked this build and that it was informative in terms of techniques to hide the screws because it turns out that's a hell of a lot of extra work. And if you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to answer them in the comment section below. Also, if you want to win the pen I talked about, normally you should know what to do if you've watched the video. So thanks for watching and I will see you guys soon with three awesome videos that I have already filmed and will come out in the upcoming weeks. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe if you aren't, of course. See you guys next time.